Relative promoter units is one strategy for encapsulating the strength of a promoter. Encapsulation is the attachment of formal properties to a DNA sequence. This is the essence of the part concept, but it's still not entirely clear what information should be captured about a sequence and how it should be measured. Here is an example of what it might look like. The name and sequence of the part is shown in orange, and an object describing its function is shown in blue. We are stating that the promoter is for use in prokaryotes, so all bets are off if you try to put this in eukaryotes, that it relies on sigma 70, and its strength is 74. This model of a promoter will be sufficient for the way it is conceived in this paper about RPUs, but let's first point out some of the limitations of it. First, it only makes a concrete reference to a specific sigma factor. We don't know what that sigma factors from different bacteria would all interact with this promoter in the same way, and we also don't know that it won't react with the other sigma factors present in the system. The idea that its strength can be reduced to a single number is also unclear, but regardless, we know that promoters don't always display the same activity, so we can't interpret that number simply as meaning, say, that 74 mRNAs will be produced per unit time in the cell. That number will have to be interpreted according to some more complicated model. In this paper by Endy and co-workers, they describe a means of measuring promoter strength that can be interpreted according to a simple transcription model that allows them to predict relative transcription rates. The paper derives a basis for RPU based on other models of transcription and translation. The paper does this derivation slightly differently than I will here, but the gist is the same. I have defined a constitutive promoter as one that only interacts with a sigma factor. Thus, that promoter exists in two states in the cell, one that is free and thus inactive, and one that has recruited an RNA polymerase by binding to a sigma factor and is thus active in producing mRNAs at some constant rate beta. I can thus express the rate of transcription as the fraction of DNAs that are in the sigma-bound state multiplied by beta and the number of DNAs present. If I model that as differential equation, I would also include a degradation term that is proportional to the amount of mRNA in the cell. This part of that differential equation describes a binding equilibrium. What's going on here is that the sigma 70 portion of the RNA polymerase binds to the minus 35 and minus 10 regions of the promoter. This association of two biomolecules into a complex always follows this form. 100% binding is an asymptotic thing. The molecules never really get there, but if their concentration is far greater than KD, the molecules will stoichiometrically titrate each other out as complexes. Some interactions in the cell have KDs far lower than the concentration of the components and thus titrate out their reaction partners. Others, like this sigma factor interaction, have KDs comparable to their concentration in the cell and thus subtle differences in sequence leads to changes in the percent occupation of the promoter. To put all this in perspective, the volume of E. coli is such that one molecule in the cell is around one nanomolar. If you have a thousand protein molecules in the cell, then their concentration is micromolar. Thus in the range of KD between 10 to the 6th and 10 to the 9th, Complexes in the cell are in equilibrium with their monomers, and the distribution between the states is defined by this expression. This all leads directly to changes in the amount of mRNA that gets produced. Here you see that the KD for the initiation complex is well modeled by this simple biophysical model. If I make a steady state assumption, then I can solve for m as a function of the other terms. Consider we have two different cells that differ only in terms of which constitutive promoter is upstream of the reporter gene. In the two constructs, the sequence of the mRNA is the same, so presumably all aspects of translation is the same. The only thing that differs is a few positions in the two promoters and thus the amount of mRNA that will get produced. If we want to predict absolute concentrations of M, we need to know how many available sigma 70s there were, their KEQ for the promoter, the concentration of the DNA, the degradation rate of the mRNA, and the rate beta at which an mRNA gets produced for sigma bound complexes. The trouble with this is that the sigma 70 and beta terms depend heavily on the state of the cell and the environmental conditions. In practice, we do not have any models that can deal with absolute rates right now. 
However, if instead we wish to predict the ratio of two mRNAs, our task is easier. So we're talking about taking the ratio of two of these equations, so it's like an m over m. We know that subtle things like a few positions in a promoter rarely affect DNA concentration, so in this ratio, DNAs will cancel itself out. Similarly, the sequence of the mRNA and the type of sigma factor and its relationship to the RNAP are the same between the two, so the beta term and gamma terms also should cancel out. The only terms that survive deal with the concentration of the sigma factor and its affinity for the promoter. Since we are talking about the same sigma factor under the same environmental conditions in both cases, this all reduces down to a single variable that is a binding constant, which is different for the two promoters. If I assume that sigma 70 concentrations are far from saturating, then this all simplifies down to saying that m is proportional to the binding constant, and the ratios of activity for two different promoters are going to be ratios of their mutual binding constants. If all those simplifying assumptions hold true, then you should be able to define one promoter sequence as a standard, and in their study they define the standard to be the promoter part J23101. By measuring activity of other promoters relative to this standard, we should be able to predict relative transcription rates between two promoters in different contexts. In this experiment, they are doing pairwise combinations of the relative fluorescence of promoter GFP constructs. In each condition, the white bar is J23101, and the gray bar is promoter J23150. The different conditions are different plasmid backbones with different copy numbers and different temperatures and different incubation times. Though the different conditions all give different absolute levels, the ratio for the two promoters is invariant in each case, indicating that our assumptions hold true at least for constitutive promoters driving GFP. They also demonstrate that the measurement of RPU is invariant across measurement techniques such as cytometry versus bulk fluorescence measurements. It is also independent of what lab did the measurement. This concept of RBU is still a very new idea, and there are very few examples that expose fully where it works and where it doesn't. One situation where it definitely falls apart is when things you add to the cell affect the physiology of the cell. For example, if you are altering the growth rate of the bacterium with the genes you added, that means you are affecting things like beta and DNA concentrations, and thus the mathematical assumptions we made break down. 